Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, my name is Andy Dio. I'm the VP of Marketing at Saratech. And today we have a special guest speaker, Mr. David Nord from Dinsmore. Um, Dinsmore is a Saratech customer who's a provider of 3D printing, additive manufacturing, design for prototyping, rapid prototyping, and injection molding services since 2002. Uh, and I'm sure Dave will uh, go a little bit more into detail in all of Dinsmore capability. Um, so today, we want to share with you the benefits of additive manufacturing. Uh, our, our goal for this webinar is really to introduce you to uh, the different technology that's out there and how you can use that to incorporate into your current product development process. Um, from IDC data, global spending on 3D printing will be around $13.8 billion this year. And it's estimated to grow to $22.7 billion by 2022. So a lot of companies are investing into this technology today. Um, why? Because it does give them a competitive edge. So if you have not or uh, if you are about to look into this technology, now is a great time to do that. And hopefully with this webinar, we are able to help you uh, make some decision about what you need to do. Just some housekeeping um, information. At any time, if you have questions during the, the webcast, go ahead and type it in your chat box. We do have a Q&A uh, session at the end, and we'll address any of the questions that you have during the event. I just want to take a quick minute to tell you about Saratech. So at Saratech, we help customers develop better products, faster and more cost effective by providing product lifecycle management software, engineering services, and manufacturing solutions, including 3D printing. Um, we have the distinctive um, pleasure to be Siemens uh, PLM number one partner in the Americas for the past six years. So we work with a lot of customers to help them, um, you know, with their product development process. We are established in 2002. We have over 90 employees all across the country, and over half of our employees are engineers. So um, that's what we do. We're an, an engineering company and working with companies like you to help you make better products. With that, i like to pass the presentation over to Mr. David Nord at Dinsmore. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate it. Um, really excited about this opportunity. Uh, my name is Dave Nord. I'm with, I'm an account manager with Dinsmore. Um, Basically, uh, we're excited to go over 3D printing today. Uh, definitely, if you guys are not in uh, the game of 3D printing, this is gonna be an overview on how you can get more involved uh, and how you can add this to your product development cycle with the, uh, with the thought of, of crunching that development cycle, getting you to market faster uh, and, and all that fun stuff. Um, so we're definitely going to concentrate how to incorporate additive manufacturing and product development to, to save time and, and reduce, uh, reduce price. Um, <clears throat> so we'll go over the, uh, the, the overview of, of the webinar today. Go to go over, uh, what about Dinsmore, uh, who we are as a company, um, our services that we provide, uh, how to transition into additive manufacturing. Uh, a lot of, of people now are using CNC machining or injection mold. Uh, we're going to basically go over a glaze over how you can add uh, additive manufacturing to that program uh, as far as either prototyping and or if it's a great match, full production and, and get away from being married to a tool, setup fees, all that fun stuff. 
uh, technologies and materials, the different technologies of 3D printing we have, the different materials under each, and how to select the right fit. Uh, and then we're going to wrap it up with our our 2019 additive manufacturing strategy and audit that we provide. Who are we? So Dinsmore has been around uh, since 2002 as well. Uh, we have a 14,000 square foot facility in Irvine, California. Uh, we're pushing uh, just over, I believe, 30 employees now. Um, we consider ourselves experts in 3D printing for production applications, assembly planning, prototyping, fit checks, and class A modeling. Uh, we loosely use the word 3D printing because I think a lot of people associate 3D printing with prototyping and we are getting away from that in our industry. The big push for the last few years is those production applications and opportunities. Um, and, and that's what our focus is, is we are definitely educating everybody to get them in the know as not only prototyping, but production opportunities as well. Uh, on staff, we have some degreed engineers that are proficient in additive technologies. Uh, I know we've got uh, a master in SolidWorks on board here, a uh, really great crew. Uh, what sets Dinsmore aside as a company is our customer service. Um, and, you know, we're, we're customer driven solutions provider. Uh, if we get some a project in, we don't just hit go and 3D print something. We actually have these uh, degreed engineers glaze over files to let our customers know and communicate if they're printable or perhaps um, the, the dialogue starts there to, to get the file to a printable state. <clears throat> the services that we uh, offer here at Dinsmore. 3D printing and additive manufacturing. We've got a lot of different technologies in-house. Um, we offer DFP, which is a design for prototyping. That's when we hold the hands of engineers that we work with to update their files to get their uh, parts more printable. Uh, we offer DFAM, newer in our industry, designed for additive manufacturing. So if there is that manufacturing, that, that production opportunity, uh, what we'll do is work with the engineers to get that file to not only a printable state, but uh, a printable state to the, um, to, to the, the 3D printing technology that lends itself to production. Uh, we offer CNC here as well, machining. Uh, an old school way of building parts, which is RTV, room temperature vulcanization, tooling and casting. And we'll go over that later on in, uh, as a service we offer. Uh, Class A model specialists, I'll go over that right now, actually. Uh, Dinsmore is, obviously I'm biased, but one of the best in the business to offer a Class A show model, which means we are in the business of uh, uh, fooling uh, audiences uh, with parts that look like injection molded parts, uh, beautiful production looking parts for those um, uh, th those big board meetings or, or trade shows before somebody uh, cuts a tool or goes into full production or needs that funding. And uh, we also provide an additive manufacturing audit, which we'll go into as well. Um, basically, we want to see what you do, see your uh, your, your production line and, and where we can add additive to your current program. Something that's definitely needed to stay up to date uh, with manufacturing these days. Technology is offered. Dinsmore offers a lot of different 3D printing technologies, uh, a lot of acronyms. I'm going to go over all those. Probably not going to sink in today if you're not familiar with 3D printing, which is fine. Took me a while to get uh, to know all of them as well. Uh, the first one is DLS, which is Digital Light Synthesis from a company called Carbon. Uh, DMLS, which is a direct, direct uh, base, basically a sintering process, direct metal laser sintering, where we actually uh, shoot a laser into powders and print metal parts. Uh, FDM, Fuse uh, de Deposition Modeling, that's where you see a lot of these home 3D printers or desktop printers, uh, 
printing parts. FRSLA, which is something that we have a trademark on, fine resolution stereolithography, that goes in line with SLA, stereolithography, a traditional way of 3D printing parts. MJF, we're gonna have an emphasis on that today. That's from Hewlett Packard. That's their proprietary technology uh, called multi-jet fusion. Polyjet, SLS, uh, another centering process for plastics and nylons. And then of course, RTV tooling and casting. We're gonna go over some of the technologies here one by one starting with an array of machines that we have in-house. Now, Dinsmore currently is pushing uh, almost 30 machines in-house in an array of three different 3D printing technologies. These are the ones that we're gonna showcase uh, strictly because of not only the technology itself, but the build platform size. Uh, we've got uh, SLA in the top left corner. This is our Pro X800. Uh, builds beautiful parts. Um, the build platform size is roughly 21 and a, I'm sorry, 25 and a half by almost 22 by pushing 30. So uh, capability of building really large parts without sectioning and bonding, or a lot of small parts to keep the per piece price down. Uh, FDM right next to it. That's a uh, Fortis 900. Um, where we actually can build parts 36 by 24 by 36, and these are all in inches. Uh, Carbon's DLS technology on the right there. Smaller build platform, we're pushing about seven and a half by four and a half by 13. Uh, but we have, again, multiple machines, and we are a partner with Carbon. We'll go into that when we talk about that technology. Bottom left is multi-jet fu fusion from Hewlett Packard. This has been a powerhouse for us. Uh, the build platform size is 15 by 11 by 15. And in this technology, we can actually nest parts. We can stack parts like a, a burger and, and build more in a build platform. Also, um, a production opportunity. And then Polyjet, build platform size on that is, uh, you know, roughly 19.3 by 15.5 by 7.9. A great way of 3D printing in multi-materials and colors. And again, we'll go over that uh, as we go through the technologies. This is kind of a preface to our audit, uh, a great way of showing how we can take a look at a project and start divvying up. We call this uh, an explore, exploring process where we get with our customers, we look at the project as a whole, and we start to carve out what parts in a project are a great fit for additive and uh, what technology and additive we're gonna attack each part in. Uh, so this is what we want to basically crawl into with our customers. Sorry, I think we got a little bit of in interference here. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at everybody's project as a whole. We're going to divide up the parts and what's great for what technology and what material, and we attack it that way. Um, so we're going to start by talking about Polyjet. The first couple I'm going to talk about here are great technologies for prototyping. Uh, Polyjet has been around for quite some time. Out of all of our technologies, it has one of the highest resolutions, uh, 3D printing somewhere between 16 and 32 microns. Uh, it allows us to print in multiple materials, uh, rigid materials and flexible materials as well. Not only separately, but we can actually print assemblies uh, think over molds for this technology in one piece. Uh, the, the elastomeric material mimics the look and feel of rubber and we can print in different durometers. Uh, great for proof of concept, fit checks, and prototyping. The, the material is uh, acrylic based, so it, it, it's great for those applications, sometimes not the best fit for um, actual function. Uh, <clears throat> this is still uh, a technology where we're receiving new resins, um, so constantly upgrading on stronger and, and better materials in this technology. It's, it's definitely not a dinosaur out there. It's still used. It's great, and the parts coming off it are beautiful. You can see the two helmet pieces on the machine there in multi-print with the different uh, 
different colors. Build platform on that is nine, roughly 19 and a half by 15 and a half by uh, almost eight inches. <clears throat> the materials that we offer in this, uh, the rigid materials are gonna be a Vero clear and a Vero white and a Vero black. These are basically rigid materials that mimic kind of an ABS or, or polycarb. Uh, you can see on the engine block there, that would be a Vero white and a rigid material. Beautiful piece. Uh, we it, It's built in a, um, uh, everything that we build in additive is supported. We basically water jet off the support. And uh, the post process of this is, is very little and not a lot of sanding or any of that involved. Off the machine, the parts are very, very smooth. Um, the Agilis material is that elastomeric. You can see that gasket going on there. That one in particular was printed separately, but if we wanted to print that together as an assembly, like I said earlier, in the overmold process, uh, we can yield parts as one piece, rigid and elastomeric. <clears throat> Sterilithography, SLA, uh, another traditional way of 3D printing parts. Uh, very smooth parts off of the machine as well. Um, we can create parts utilizing laser technology. What, what, out of all the 3D printing technologies, this is one of the most amazing to watch in person. Uh, you know, following up to this, this webinar, uh, if you're local in the Orange County area, definitely set up an appointment to stop by with one of our account managers here uh, and, and check out our machines. So you've got a, um, a vat that's full of a liquid photopolymer. It's epoxy based. A UV laser will hit the very top surface and in layering, write the part. Uh, it's it's pretty amazing to watch. Um, the resolution varies uh, starting at a very fine resolution at two thousandths all the way down to ten thousandths. Uh, so uh, again, we'll hold your hand through that and in, in, in looking at which way to uh, to print parts. There's a range of resins to meet requirements. We've got a PC like materials, ABS like materials, some high heat deflection materials, um, and we have some biocompatible materials as well with full traceability that I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, design for this technology is pretty free. Uh, in additive, uh, for most technologies, we can basically throw a lot of geometries at these processes and they'll print just about anything uh, that we throw at it. Build platform on that we already went through is 25 and a half by roughly 22 by 30. Really large build platform there on this particular machine. Here's some of the materials that are offered in stereolithography. Uh, actually, I wanted to highlight uh, the BioClear uh, material here. This is a clear material in the top left slide or the top left picture there. It's a clear material. Uh, that's biocompatible. We offer, offer full traceability and certs with this material. Uh, great for some medical applications. Um, when we get to know our customers and what they do, we will carve out which, by technology, which materials we use best and, and, and give them some, uh, some support there as well. <clears throat> the 9120 and the 8120 flex at the bottom is a polypropylene-like material. The rest of them are either clear or white materials that mimic ABS or polycarb. In secondary process, the clear materials, we can uh, basically polish those up and make them see-through great for lens applications. We're going to shift now to some more production opportunity technologies, uh, starting with FDM, fused deposition modeling. Uh, this is also a traditional way of 3D printing parts and thermoplastics that's the big change here so not epoxy based resins not acrylic based resins strong uh resins that are strong thermoplastics uh basically what happens here the way that i in a nutshell explain it is if you can imagine a hot glue gun building a square by layers over and over and over again building a box um in in these thermoplastics that are really strong uh, we've, we, we're going to go over some of the, uh, the materials next, but, uh, <clears throat> this technology yields, a, a, a little bit of a rippled surface finish. The build lines are very significant here, depending on what resolution we choose for the application. 
so I set the expectations a little lower for the surface finish here, but very good, strong parts, a great application for functioning prototypes and or if there's that production opportunity, B surface, uh, not A surface parts. <clears throat> Here's some of the materials that are offered in that technology. Some of the ones I'd like to highlight, obviously ABS is one of the most commonly used plastics out there and, and we've got that covered, but uh, we are a Stratasys tier one supplier of materials, which has unlocked us for a lot of materials for our customers. ABS um, ESD7 is a material that's uh, an electrostatic dissipative material. Uh, that we offer uh, as opposed to maybe adding a coating in a second secondary process uh, for prototyping and production opportunities. We have a PC uh, and an ABS material that is ISO certified, the ABS M30i and the PC ISO. These are ISO certified materials, great for uh, medical applications as well. Uh, anybody in, in aerospace, Ultem 9085 and 1010, these are the 9085 is flight certified, so uh, we are actually building not only prototypes, but production parts that can be put up in the air. It's, it's certified by the FAA. <clears throat> Digital light synthesis. This is one of the newest technologies out there. It was brought to us by a company called Carbon. They're a startup company. Uh, that just went game busters. Their whole program was for production uh, and, and their focus is production. Uh, we have four of these machines in house. We are a production partner with the company Carbon. Uh, so this is what really was a game changer for Dinsmore and getting into those production opportunities. Um, it was formerly known as CLIP, Continuous Liquid Interface Production. They changed that to digital light synthesis about a year and a half ago. Uh, they use oxygen to where uh, the, basically you've got a, a projector that shoots from the bottom and writes the part from the bottom in that cassette. And uh, with the oxygen and the way that it continuously builds parts, you, you will see some build striations that the build layering in uh, the surface finish of the part but it is very, very smooth. It looks like a vinyl record. And um, we've got a lot of companies using this for production. Uh, isotropically strong parts built in this technology, which means that in all axis of a part, uh, they're strong and uh, not as uh, opposed to some of the other technologies out there that, that aren't. Uh, <clears throat> Wide variation of shapes. Uh, this is a little bit of a trickier technology where we work with our customers since parts are being built upside down. We have vacuum issues uh, that can basically be cured with a, a slight design mod. Build platform on this is seven and a half inches by four and a half by pushing 13. And again, we have a fleet of these machines to where when we hit go, we can build multiple parts on all the machines that are dedicated to your project. This uh, is showing basically the process. You can see the, the build platform dips into the cassette, into the, the resin, and pulls the part out of the resin, building the part. <clears throat> part the, the area you see on the, on the top of that, that lattice structure, that honeycomb you're seeing is all support to keep it off the build platform. And that's a good representation of a, a surface finish right off of the machine in a clear material. <clears throat> Through this continuous building, we get a lot smoother of a surface finish. Uh, that little hole at the bottom of that geometry there is a great representation of how we dealt with a vacuum issue. Uh, so we can pull the part out of the, of the build without it getting sucked off the build platform there. So let's talk about production uh, in this technology just really quick. Uh, you, you've got a picture of a part that is basically optimized and stacked on a build platform. It's, this is, happens to be a handle. Um, we, what we, the, the goal is, is to not build one part at a time here. Uh, it's to stack that build platform and get the repeatability, um, which is necessary for production applications. 
uh, faster build times, which enables more builds per day. So you can see that build platform would build really quickly. We would remove that build platform, start a new build in parallel to the other machines building the same parts, and they would go to post-process after that. Um, this is a really smart technology that uses less resin, so we don't have a big burn rate where you're paying for resin that's not used. Uh, that's all done in their software. Um, smaller parts are less likely to need sacrificial support structures helping to reduce resin usage. What we want to do is keep that uh, support structure down. There's a picture of a, a, of a person's two fingers there. This particular technology, the sweet spot, is parts that are less than two fingers in size uh, and, and that can be competitive to an injection molding process up to 30,000 units. And uh, we're going to touch on that in a little bit here, but uh, just think of the opportunity of not only designing, uh, designing freedom, that you're not designing for an injection mold process for that tooling process, undercuts and whatnot, but uh, also not being married to that tool when you have your next revision come out. You just uh, redesign the part and its new rev, we do a couple first articles and boom, we hit go again to full production as opposed to uh, traditional production opportunities taking months to do that. <clears throat> so this is a service that Dinsmore has added recently. We can actually add textures to your CAD files. Uh, in the past, we would give a textured surface finish by uh, either spraying that into a mold or uh, 3D printing a part, sanding it, and then painting it with a texture. We now have the capability of uh, adding textures to CAD files to, you know, one of, the, one of the biggest aesthetics of a 3D printed part is the build layering. This hides a lot of that, so it cuts down on post-process as well. Um, we use ZBrush, 3D Coat, and we're, we're partnered with Carbon on that as well. So uh, if you have a part and, you know, the, the end game customer isn't really liking the build striations and that we don't want to sand the part in a secondary process, keeping the price per piece down, we'll, we'll definitely add this, these textures to a part before we hit print and they come off the machine this way. So working a lot on that now. That has been a highlight over at Dinsmore. Plastic casting with RD, RTV tooling. So room temperature vulcanization. This is that old school way of building parts I was talking about. Uh, this is a rapid manufacturing advantage for low volume production. Uh, we basically build masters. Uh, to go over it really quick, we build masters using either stereolithography or polyjet models. We'll get the parts off of the machines. We'll usually sand those and make them beautiful because we're gonna mimic that in the process and uh, we suspend them in a box, a bounding box. We pour in silicone. We wait for the silicone to cure. That gives us the silicone cube you can see in the picture. We do a jeweler's cut into that, uh, that cube, open it up, and we sacrifice the masters. We close the cube back up, and now we have the reverse negative. We have a soft tooling mold uh, of your part. We inject urethanes that are uh, epoxy-based, Polycarbonate-like, ABS-like, uh, trying to think of some others out there, high heat deflection materials, uh, some medical resins as well. And we build the parts one by one. And uh, we roughly see about 20 to 25 beautiful castings come off of these, these tools. So these are great applications for very low volume from onesies, twosies, all the way up to, uh, to you know, hundreds, there's going to be a break off point where another technology might be a better fit and per piece cost, but you're not married to an aluminum or a steel tool. And uh, this is a great way, great way of doing pilot runs. Uh, secondary finishing can be done to enhance the parts such as painting or uh, machining as well. I'm going to touch on direct metal laser sintering. This is the 3D printing of metal. Uh, the technology has uh, definitely come a, a long way, uh, constantly being updated and upgraded. High resolutions, functional prototypes, and low volume production. You can achieve, this is the biggest selling point here, you can achieve geometry uh, that can't be done using CNC milling. So let's talk about that. In, in 
subtractive machining. Uh, there's a lot of radiuses that need to be accommodated for, uh, fillets, and uh, so, some other geometries that just can't be done using machining, or there's a lot of setup fees. In additive, when we 3D print metal parts, uh, again, the machine basically builds anything we throw at it. So uh, just think of having that uh, that freedom to design a part and, and not have the mindset of, of designing for that subtractive process. It's not going to uh, get rid of CNC machines out there. It's just another way to attack programs and parts. Uh, lightweight, high strength parts using lattices. Lattices, you're going to hear a lot in additive to cut down weight and to make uh, really strong parts, but less material to build the part. Uh, materials with aerospace, automotive, motor racing and engineering applications. So uh, anywhere uh, metal is used, we can definitely add the DMLS process. <clears throat> so let's talk about multi-jet fusion. This is Hewlett Packard's proprietary technology. Uh, the HP Jet Fusion 3D printing solution reinvents how you prototype and uh, basically we can do um, we can produce functional parts delivering uh, quality output. Uh, we can get produ production dimensional accuracy and fine detail through iterative processing. So I'm very transparent here. Uh, what we do with our customers is uh, we help them uh, not only design for the, 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 the processes, but uh, when we prototype, it's iterative to hit those tolerances that might be needed in production as well. Uh, so hitting print and, and, and thinking dead nuts on machining tolerances is, is not necessarily the, the way this is attacked. It's, it's done through multiple prints and finding out how we can achieve those tolerances for production, working with orientation uh, and working with uh, the file, the, the part with our customer to get there. Um, so another technology that's used not only for pro prototyping, but production, uh, isotropically strong parts, very dense. Uh, the build platform size, and this is roughly 15 by 11 and a half by 15. But this is the technology I spoke about earlier where we can nest parts. We can stack parts like a burger in these build platforms and uh, get full production and optimize parts. So this is how MJF works. The, the material starts its life off as a powder. Uh, the machine puts down a layer of thermoplastic powder around 80 microns thick. Uh, next, we apply liquid agents using the same inkjet technology HP has developed over 30 years plus. Uh, the fusing agent is applied where the part is to be formed in detailing agents around the edges to get crisp, crisp de definition. And then we apply infrared energy. Uh, only powder with fusing agent melts. Uh, melted powder fuses and solidifies, and it repeats for each layer. So because this starts its life as a powder, a lot of people think, hey, this is another technology, if you're familiar with 3D printing like SLS, it is not. It's not a centering process. Uh, this has been an amazing technology for Dinsmore um, for not only prototyping but production as well. So think, uh, again, textured surface finish that comes off of this machine, isotropically strong parts for full function. <clears throat> So here's some of the, the benefits of multi-jet fusion. So speed, so the parts build very, very fast. So we can literally build a whole platform of parts overnight. It goes to cooling and uh, basically a bead blast is applied to get the rest of the powder off and smooth the surface finish a little bit. And then we give the customer their parts. Um, again, we can achieve dimensional accuracy and detail through iteration isotropic and all accesses. Again, this is these are parts that are built that are strong in every access, not like some of the other prototyping technologies through 3D printing. Uh, the, the goal here is to move through the prototyping process in parallel uh, to get you to production 
in this technology. So think being able to, to go to your bench using your prototype in the material that the end game material will be in production. This is a huge value add to a lot of our uh, customers where they're getting parts very, very fast in the material that they would get where you're not necessarily going to get that through injection mold in the prototyping process. You're going to get parts that might be uh, not strong. You have to be very careful with them and with the mindset of, hey, we're going to build this in nylon uh, in production. So this is a nice value add to our customers. Uh, it's cost efficient in both low and high volume quantities. Uh, this is definitely one of the, the least expensive ways of 3D printing parts out there. There's a lot of value there. Again, geometry freedom in design. Uh, you don't have to worry about undercuts, radiuses, or, or any of that. Uh, and it's a production grade material. Nylon 12 PA seems to be our champion. Uh, that is a production material and uh, very, very strong parts. Uh, <clears throat> So the, the build volume, again, is 16 by 12 by 16. We can build uh, parts that are all nested. And uh, if it's a small part, you know, we can fill, fit hundreds on a build platform. We have three of these carts that build. So basically, we pump the part into the machine, start the machine. The machine finishes its build. We pull the cart. It goes to cool, push in the next cart, wash, rinse, and repeat for full production. Our standard lead time on this from the technology is roughly about three to five days. Of course, we always uh, can offer expedite uh, and, and move things around to get customers' parts uh, by the end of the next day. Uh, again, thinking about crunching that product development cycle. Accuracy, right now, uh, we kind of sell this as plus or minus 12 thousandths up to pushing four inches and then plus or minus roughly three thousands for every inch there on stacked. Uh, so again, once we get a file from a customer, a part, uh, we hit print, we measure it, and uh, if it's way out, then we uh, change the orientation, we print again. And uh, the more we print a part, the, the better we know how to set up this part, not only for prototyping, but production opportunities as well. Uh, the minimum wall thickness in every technology um, what we do is we have guidelines where we're going to ask for, you know, thicker walls. This one happens to be 20 thousandths and, uh, and features. We definitely want to set you up for success of a, of a, to yield a great 3D printed part. So <clears throat> we're going to kind of come, not necessarily compare, but uh, we're going to go over the advantages of uh, HP. HP's multi-jet fusion and, and machining. So we don't want to give anybody the mindset that they're going to get rid of machining as a whole. Uh, machining is definitely needed. Uh, the you know the parts that come off of the, the the machines are probably the most dimensionally accurate out there. Uh, it's it's also used in a post process for possibly some 3D printing parts. So you know we can think of one over the other. We can combine the two for a, a nice value to uh, to the, the customer. So let's talk about HC, HP's multi-jet fusion. Um, again, that uh, I can't say enough times, it gives you the freedom to design without worrying about uh, injection mold uh, tooling uh, or subtractive processes where we have to worry about those undercuts or uh, any of those radiuses or any of, of, of those uh, that we hit those walls with. Um, from the printer, we can create near net shape parts. Uh, and then if needed, if, if we can't get it through that iterative process to get uh, those tight tolerances, we can actually print the part and then it can go to a machining process after. Uh, we can eliminate time and costs associated with low value features. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, Machining parts can take a, a lot of time. 3D printing parts uh, is very, very fast. So you can be working on your next uh, revision in a day as opposed to going through those the, the programming of machining your part. Um, there's setup costs associated with that. 
and there's uh, material waste as well. Uh, so we want everybody to keep that in mind uh, on how to bring additive to their current program and, and kind of open their minds up on how, how can we use these additive processes in not only our prototyping cycle, but possibly production as well. Um, so we're going to kind of go over this here uh, on how to transition into additive manufacturing. <clears throat> so additive manufacturing can be applied to new products, manufacturing aids, and spare parts. So new products, this is probably the best opportunity where uh, you can design for the process, uh, new geometries, uh, manufacturing aids, think jigs and fixtures, uh, also great in FDM as well, um, and multi-jet fusion. So uh, we definitely want to look for those opportunities. Uh, so basically, the low-hanging fruit of plastic parts and metal parts with low load requirements. Uh, so maybe doing that exploration on parts you're either designing or parts you guys are manufacturing already, and maybe you want to make that shift to additive. <clears throat> and can it work? Uh, you know, what's the application? Uh, what's the size of the part and the weight? You know, we're showing you some of the build platform sizes here, uh, so you can implement that into looking at your parts and seeing if they're a good match. Obviously, if you're building a part that's 30 inches by 30 inches, um, additive in full production might not be the best match. It could be in, in prototyping, but not necessarily in full production. The mechanical properties and, and the materials of, the, uh, of what you're using, again, uh, it, nylon 12 is a, is a production material. ABS is a production material polycarb, I think you see where I'm going, uh, when you're building, you know, new geometries of legacy parts, these are uh, some great parts that we can look at in, in getting you to additive. Surface finish, uh, our low-hanging fruit there in additive, or yours for that matter, uh, in some of these technologies for production is going to be B surface area parts, uh, textured parts, maybe parts that are not necessarily uh, have to be aesthetically beautiful. Uh, the less hands-on that we have in post-processing is going to keep our per piece price down. And uh, th those are the easiest uh, that are that are great for the application. And does it make sense? Uh, so <clears throat> 3D part costs better than alternatives, designed for additive manufacturing. And uh, so, so let's talk about this for, for a brief moment. Uh, this is something that's thrown at me constantly. So what I have is somebody that brings me a machine part or they bring me a part that's off of an injection mold process and they'll say, okay, Dave, I'm really interested in 3D printing my parts. I want to do production. I'm excited. And they'll throw a part down in front of me on a table and they'll say, yeah, this part roughly makes me, uh, that cost me $2 to make. Okay. To have this conversation, we really need to amortize all of the necessarily the necessary uh, variables that it took to build that part. And this is very important to understand on how to add additive to your program. And the reason why is because when I look at that part and they throw out $2, uh, we know that that part did not cost them $2 to make. So first off, let's talk about how they got the geometry of the part. They had to design for prototyping, which is the overhead of their company, the engineering hours that are involved. Those are all costs that are associated in the design of the part. And usually they have to design for prototyping, which takes a lot of revs, a lot of uh, different builds. They uh, consistently revise the, their, their part, and then boom, they've got a part that they like, and they kind of put it in the freezer for a little bit. Then the, they want to talk about manufacturing the part. Uh, the part then gets taken out of that freezer and they start to design for manufacturing. Okay, so uh, more engineering hours, uh, more of the company's overhead involved, and then building the part over and over again. And then we freeze the design again and then it goes off to tooling. 
all of those costs are associated in getting that $2 part, okay? That doesn't include when you cut a tool and you amortize that cool tooling cost as well. Uh, something to think about. So uh, that $2 part goes through a lot of hands before it becomes that $2 part. In additive manufacturing, while you're designing in your 3D printing parts and you have those freedoms, uh, you're going to get end game production parts in your hand to bench test and you don't have to go through all of those iterations of a design for prototype and then a design for manufacturing. Uh, you can curtail that down to uh, a lot less revisions and uh, you know, giving your end game customer a production part in their hand and then doing those low volume runs um, and getting there a lot faster. Getting to market faster is is one of the the, the biggest uh, value adds, but not being married to a tool. So let's talk about that. So you've cut a tool, you're producing parts, and you find out that there's uh, an issue with the parts, or you find out that uh, you guys uh, are married to a bunch of, uh, of uh, inventory. In additive, you basically have a digital inventory. Uh, you only build low volumes at a time, and you're not going to get stuck with that stale inventory. If you have a design rev, you simply throw the machine a new part, you print a couple first articles, you test them out, they're good, and then boom, you're back in production. Uh, and, and the more you're, you're working with it, uh, the, the more you're going to know that process, own it, and, and, and build parts a lot faster end game parts and go back to production. <clears throat> Additive manufacturing strategy, audit. Yes, I can't read. Let's go back down here. Okay. So additive manufacturing strategy and audit options with Dinsmore. So what is your 2019 additive strategy? What are you guys going to do to add additive if it isn't currently implemented into your, your program? How are you going to add it? Um, basically, what, what we offer is obviously to schedule a meeting with Dinsmore, a uh, sales representative like myself, or we have other uh, account managers on staff. What we want to do is we want to look at what you do. We'd like this to be at your facility. We want to see the parts that you guys are currently making. We want to find those opportunities of, hey, you could be using additive manufacturing not only to build this part, but I see that in your assembly line, it takes a long time to assemble a part. Let's build a jig or a fixture to cut down that assembly time uh, even if it cuts minutes off of assembly uh, in full production, that becomes hours and days, and that can save your company uh, a lot of money, make you look like a hero. We're going to be looking for those opportunities. We're going to discuss, discuss program, life stage. Are you in your prototype? Are you in production? Are these replacement parts? Uh, and, and we're going to curtail uh, your additive plan to prototyping what parts are great for production. Do you have a legacy tool that you don't have uh, access to to build low volume legacy parts? We have a lot of customers come to us and they can't find a tool anymore or it's going to take them three months to get their customer just a couple of parts. These are all great value adds to, uh, to build parts quickly for their customers. Uh, you're going to be prepared to, to discuss parts. The, the usage of your parts, what are the material requirements? These are all the qualification uh, questions we're going to ask to align you with the right material, the right technology. Is it a great match? Is it not? Um, bringing prob problematic production parts to the surface to see if uh, we can reduce lead times, assembly time, supply chain costs, and redesign for additive manufacturing. This is what I just kind of went over. Um, some of those parts that are a real pain in the butt to uh, possibly injection mold or it's just not toolable at that point or it takes, you know, six different processes to get it machined. You're building jigs and, and fixtures to machine it. it. It has to go through four different processes and all the programming and everything to build the parts. In additive, we can cut all that down and help you create an additive manufacturing plan. 
So that's basically uh, an overview. Uh, there's a lot more in depth. Uh, and, and obviously that's something that uh, we can go over a, a, at, a, at a different time, but just kind of glazes over how you can think about adding additive or shifting to additive with new parts, existing parts, or uh, uh, parts that are become you know a, a pain and shift them over to additive, not only for prototyping but full production as well, getting those uh, those um, product development cycles crunched and get to market a lot faster. Uh, so at this time, I'm going to hand it back over to Andy, and uh, maybe we can have some Q and A. Thank you, Dave. Um, as, as you can see, there is so much information um, about additive manufacturing, what you can do, and, and uh, Dave, really appreciate you um, sharing with us. As, as you can see, there's so many different technologies out there. How do you know which one is the right one? What is the right process? You know, where do you start? And, and that's, that's why, you know, companies like Dinsmore and Ceratech, we're, we're here to help you make those kind of decisions right because this is this is new territory for a lot of companies but people are investing in it there is significant saving and advantage in investing in additive manufacturing um, so while we're waiting here um, if you have any questions please go ahead and fill it in in the chat box meanwhile we have a, a couple that came in during your presentation Dave um, so uh, we have a question that says, generally speaking, what size part is a good match for additive manufacturing? That's a great question. So uh, it, it really depends on the technology. Uh, like, for instance, in the DLS technology from Carbon, uh, when we do that uh, exploration of, of a lot of different parts that might be sitting and, in, in, you know, kind of laid out on a table or we look at a, at a uh, a blown up um, assembly of uh, of a program or or a, a part that that two finger or less seems to be the best match up to that thirty thousand quantity and volume. However, if the part fits in a build platform and you're only doing ten parts and you don't want to cut a tool for it, it can be a, a, a fantastic uh, match to do really low volume. Or perhaps uh, it might sound funny, but you might spend a little bit more to get parts faster that are a little bit larger in those low volumes uh, in production materials that are isotropically strong, just to get them faster and not go through all those those development cycles. In multi-jet fusion, we have a big, bigger build platform and we can nest those parts. So that two finger rule. Uh, I would say it's a little bit larger than that, maybe something the size of your fist and less. There's always going to be a break-off point in size of part. Um, you know, if it's too large, let's keep the, the, the part size down. If it's really small, we see that breaking point around 30,000. If you come to us and you say, Dave, I want to quote for, uh, you know, we're thinking about building 100,000 units. Well, that pretty much does not lend itself to additive. Are we going to get there one day? Not sure. But uh, right now, I'm going to bring everybody back to earth and say that's not a great match. But uh, uh, again, in that uh, working with a customer and doing that exploration, looking at parts, the more we do that, uh, uh, the engineers are going to realize really quickly what size of part it lends itself to additive. Great. Um there's another question that came in. So you, you showed a picture of an uh, of a, of a car in the beginning of your presentation that has you know what parts are can be used uh, can we use additive for and, and all that that was great. Are there any um, do you have examples of other industries that are currently using or 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 have used additive manufacturing? Absolutely. So that happens to be in the DLS technology. We have a uh, one of the largest uh, OEMs out there in the auto world that uh, currently is using the the technology and their EPX material for full production. What they needed is a solution to uh, roughly, I believe it was ten or twenty thousand uh, uh, vehicles. 
that we're going to be in an area where the EPA would not allow something that was involved in their air conditioning system. So what they needed was a plug uh, for three different models. And uh, they used the EPX, which is an epoxy-based material uh, in the DLS technology to, to basically fill that void. Uh, I believe the product development cycle all the way to production in that was uh, in a matter of like a month and they hit uh, go on the full production and they've filled that void and um, basically something that seemed like it was going to be a huge problem and slow down uh, their production cycle uh, was tamed and uh, now they're looking for uh, applications such as that not only in their prototyping where they need functional parts but uh, in full production as well uh, so we've got a few OEMs that are using the technology in full production. Uh, we also see a lot, uh, not just in auto, but uh, we're currently working with uh, in, in the uh, medical space and med device, full production using uh, a white material that's a rigid polyurethane that's ISO certified and um, uh, again, isotropically strong parts low volume for med device and uh, ISO certified and class six certs on that as well. Uh, we're seeing some in, in aerospace using DMLS, the, the 3D printing in metal. Uh, basically their big drive is building geometries that they can't yield off a of machine. So that's a real value add there. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, again, I, I would like to take this um, moment to thank everyone for joining us today and thank you uh dave and the dinsmore team to uh you know jumping on and sharing your knowledge with us there's definitely tons of good information again if you guys have any questions have some more in-depth discussion that you want to do uh like they mentioned you know um dinsmore team can help you out in terms of figuring out um how to approach additive manufacturing sarah tech we're definitely here to help um and so just please get in touch with us and uh, we'll be more than happy to uh, work with you. Thank you everyone and uh, thank you again Dave and have a great day. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Appreciate it.